Hi guys, my name is Susan Morales and my channel is about following Jesus and I think learning about apologetics is a part of that. Um, if this is something that interests you, I'd love it if you'd subscribe. Today we're going to be talking about how Jesus and the Christian worldview actually elevated the status of women and I've asked Wesley Huff to join the conversation and help us answer this question. Wesley holds a BA in Sociology from York University, a Master's of Theological Studies from Tyndale University, and is currently doing a PhD in Biblical Studies at the University of Toronto's Wycliffe College. Am I right? Yep. <laughs> so thank you for being with us. You betcha. Glad to be here. And um, so before we begin, I would love it if you can share with us um, how you became interested in apologetics and the whole story behind that. Yeah, definitely. Well, as a bit more of a background as to who I am, I grew up a missionary kid. I grew up overseas for a portion of my childhood. My parents uh, lived and worked in the Middle East. I was born in Pakistan originally, but we left uh, not long after I was born. And then eventually we ended up in uh, the Middle Eastern country of Jordan. And that plays a big part into some of the apologetic and evangelism work that I do on university campuses uh, here in Canada, where I live, I live in, in Toronto, Canada, with Muslims. But my faith journey and interest in apologetics started when my parents had come back from overseas. And just before my 12th birthday, I was diagnosed with a rare neurological condition called acute transverse myelitis. And so what that is, is that uh, my, my body's immune system, uh, I had the flu, and my body's immune system, instead of attacking the flu, attacked the nerve endings of the base of my spinal cord and caused swelling, inflammation, and left me as a paraplegic. And it was the, the medical professionals who originally said uh, that I would be a, a paraplegic for the rest of my life that uh, I would have to get used to being physically disabled. And the short story is that one month from the day that I got that, uh, I woke up from a nap and couldn't feel my legs. I woke up on a Saturday morning, got out of bed, walked over to my wheelchair and sat down. Uh, and that was it. And it was the medical professionals who originally said that they had no true medical explanation and uh, that the recovery was miraculous. And so that definitely marked a powerful supernatural experience in my life. And yet going on from there, especially in my teen years, I really struggled with my faith. I really struggled with intellectual questions about what I was raised to believe and why I should believe it. And so I went on a bit of a journey, um, not necessarily a crisis of faith, but really exploring worldviews, exploring belief systems, and at the end of it, after deep diving into a lot of other worldview perspectives and having the benefit as someone who grew up in various contexts and being exposed to other religious worldviews like Islam and, and Hinduism and so on, um, and exploring the, the ultimate questions of, of what those worldview perspectives held, I came out of it being more firmly established in the Christian worldview. I, I found that the Christian worldview answered the questions that I ultimately had. And then it wasn't just convenient that I was raised in a Christian household, but that it was ultimately true with a capital T. So I couldn't have told you what the word apologetics meant at that point in time, but that's what I was doing. I was exploring, I was looking for answers and a defense for what the truth was. And I came out of it believing that Jesus was the truth. And so that really started me on a journey. Uh, I went on to university, uh, not pursuing that necessarily, but as uh, I went on in my studies, uh, I eventually found that one of my biggest passions, if not the biggest passion, was exploring what I believed, communicating that with others, and helping others of other worldviews see the truth of the Christian worldview. So I eventually went on, did some graduate work in theology, and um, I currently am I'm not only uh, doing doctoral, doctoral work in biblical studies, but I work for the Canadian version of CREW, so the, the campus ministry. It's called Power to Change, and I work on a team that does uh, itinerant speaking at, at universities across Canada. 
And uh, I'm also an associate with an organization called Apologetics Canada, which is situated on the West Coast. And so I, I do uh, events, occasionally jump on their podcast, and um, write and research for those two organizations. I think it's really important to know that about you because there can be some uh, uh, preconceived uh, thinking uh, that you are only interested in apologetics because um, you're just trying to believe um, what you say you believe, but actually um, you, you have um, already uh, been open-minded and considered other worldviews as well, right? And you feel that you are convinced that Christianity is true based off of what you have researched yeah, in one way, I'm sympathetic to that objection to say, well, you're just looking for confirmation for uh, your biases, for mm -hmm. the things that your parents told you were true, for the worldview that you grew up around. Um, and I've been in situations where people have said, you know, if you were born and raised in another country, you would be whatever the, the mainstream of that is. And ironically, I was born and raised in, in majority Muslim countries. And so that doesn't really go all that far with me. Uh, but I think it is important to explore the truth. And a lot of the people I think who raised that objection don't realize that they were born and raised in secular contexts. They were born and raised in atheistic contexts. And so the argument kind of goes two ways. Uh, but at the end of the day, although sure, your upbringing, your social setting, that that of course contributes to the the perspectives that you hold, but it doesn't ultimately change what's true. So at the point of evaluating the evidence and looking into those things, coming out of it with, you know, evidence and reason and something that you can really stand on uh, makes, makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. I was remembering um, that um, when I was a little girl, um, I had these, a couple of music teachers and um you know we we ended up moving so we left that church and um i actually bumped into one of those um those guys and it was many years later but uh he kind of told us that he had not i guess he left the faith because of um he started kind of talking uh about how the disciples it was all a lie and and, you know, I, I didn't really know any, anything much about apologetics at the time to be able to really understand all the information he was, like, passing mm -hmm. on, right? And, um, but I did, what I did uh, gather in that moment as he was speaking was that somebody convinced him that uh, the reliability of the Bible um, was not um, true. And um, so there's, I've also uh, heard a lot of people raise arguments against like the goodness of God by making arguments uh, that, uh, that, that the Bible is promoting um, ideas that women are property and so forth. So um, I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts about, um, for example, what, how were women viewed in the ancient world? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good question. I think it's it's something we need to explore because uh, the the reality is is that the Bible, um, what we call the Bible, these the sixty six books of what we refer to as the Old and the New Testaments, uh, were written in a setting very different from our own. So I, I like to say the Bible is written to us, or sorry, the Bible is written for us, but it was not written to us. There's a very different audience that that the the authors of the Bible have in mind. And there's a, a very different socio-cultural context that sits behind that. Uh, if we're talking about uh, the Old Testament, the ancient Near East, uh, there was a, a perceived idea that um, there was a hierarchy. Uh, the, the king was at the top, and there, then there was a status that, that went down further and further and further. And with a lot of these cultures, when you explore into uh, what's referred to as the ancient Near East, so Mesopotamia, if you read the, the Old Testament, you read about you know, all the Hittites and uh, the Pezusites and the Canaanites and the Mosquito Bites, all those ites, right, uh, that you have in the Old Testament. Uh, 
And that's what we refer to as the ancient Near East. And it doesn't matter really where you're looking, the social stratas that you see really start to put women pretty low on, on that, that list. And likewise, when you get to the, the New Testament, um, what we refer to as the New Testament, those 27 books that talk about Jesus and, and onward, uh, his immediate followers, they're also in a setting which has um, women at, at a very low point uh, in society. In, in fact, the, the culture immediately before the time of Jesus, the, the Greek culture, uh, viewed women in particular um, through the lens of what's referred to as dualism. So there was this idea that human life was viewed as the uh, incarceration of the soul in the material body. So they believed that the spiritual was good and the physical was bad. And so um, part of that that went along with that is that there was an idea, if you read some of these philosophical texts, that women had too much body, which is a funny thing to think about. Um, and in this balance of matter and spirit, uh, this is what Plato says in, in the fourth century BC. And he actually writes that women are probably sensual reincarnations of immoral men. So there was a very, a very strange, but very negative view of women. And then even when you get to Jesus's own day, the, the first century AD, there's a guy named Plutarch, and he has this sort of uh, writing that encompasses uh, a pre-marriage counseling um, advice in it. And he says, uh, a wife must speak to her husband or through her husband. This is an exact quote. It says, a wife should not acquire her own friends, but should make her husband's friends her own. The gods are first and foremost significant friends. For this reason, it is proper for a wife to recognize only those gods whom her husband worships shutting the door to superstitious cults and other religions. And so you really start to see the idea that uh, even in the, the social hierarchies within the Greco-Roman world, women are below men. Women have a view that is, is under um, them. And, uh, and so there's not, there's not a great favorable perception of women, although it is true that certain women who had wealth in the Roman world were afforded more opportunities, who were afforded um, more rights in that sense, but they still weren't allowed to do things like vote in the the system that they had um, in, in the Roman world. And so no matter which way you swing it, even the best perceptions of a lot of the women in the ancient world were often, um, they were, they were tainted uh, by the idea that uh, men were above uh, that as as a whole. And re it's really interesting when you get to Christianity, um, because first of all, even in the, the ancient Near Eastern world that I mentioned in the Old Testament, uh, you have this idea that both men and women are created in the image of God. It says male and female, he created them. And so right really on the very first few pages of the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, you have a level of agency applied to women that they are also created in the image of God. And that was revolutionary in the ancient world, that women would have been seen on this sort of equal footing and standard as, as men. And when we, we zoom ahead and, and get to Jesus, uh, when we look at the life of Jesus, what we see is that uh, right from the beginning, he, he radically deferred from the cultural context in regard to this conversation of women. And Jesus was a constant advocate for the agency and equality of women. He talked with women. So in, in John 4 and Mark 7 uh, and Matthew 9, um, and Mark 5 and Luke 8, we see all these times where Jesus is discussing with discussing uh, various topics with women. Uh, he's encouraging towards uh, women in, in all of the Gospels, uh, Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 7, uh, John 12, and lifting up women uh, of uh, social and economic and even sexual standing, women who uh, were viewed as um, sort of objects in, in a in a sense um, through uh, 
know, prostitution and things like that. He elevates them. And, and women have, uh, they learned at Jesus's feet throughout the gospels. In fact, in, in Luke 10, we, we get an example of that. Luke 10, um, verse 39. And a, a concept that would have been seen as radical in the first century, both in Roman and Jewish settings, for a woman to sit at the feet uh, of of a, of a rabbi, of a teacher, uh, that was a, pretty revolutionary. And it's also interesting that we see, um, taking a glance at the records of early Christianity, uh, one thing that stands out very starkly is that the early Christian movement was almost entirely made up of women. And this is surprising uh, for a number of reasons. One of the first is chiefly being that the population of the Greco-Roman world was predominantly male. So maternal death in childbirth was high. The gender selective uh, infanticidal um, uh, traditions uh, was common practice when it came to girls. Uh, In fact, there was a a Roman practice known as exposure, uh, which is essentially an ancient form of abortion where the woman would give birth and if it was female, they would leave them uh, near the garbage dumps at the outside of the the city. And Christians were were famous for saving these babies, for raising them um, as their own. And all of these sorts of different factors made Roman society disproportionately male. And yet Christianity was predominantly female in its earliest earliest forms. And I think one of the big reasons for that was that it gave agency to women in particular. The the teachings of Jesus and the idea that uh, not only were both male and female created in the image of God, but then women, um, Christ died for all. He died for the male and the female. And um, then as we'll probably talk uh, a little bit more, Paul sort of explicates this in saying that when you come when you come to the table of fellowship, there is no male nor female. Not that those genders don't exist or that they're brushed over, but that we are made one in our uh, equality status uh, through Christ. And, and this was so obvious that when, when the Roman magistrate, Pliny the Younger, uh, wanted to know more about Christianity, it, it said that he inter- interrogated two female slaves who were known as deaconesses. Um, he's looking for leaders within the early church movement, and he's actually going to particular individuals who are women. Uh, there's another ancient writer named Celsus, who's a second century philosopher, philosopher, and he's a vocal proponent against women, or against Christianity, sorry. And he remarks that, and here's another quote, Christians want and are able to convince only the foolish, dishonorable, and stupid only the slaves, the women, and the little children. He sort of packs them all into the same category. And th- this is meant to mock them. You know, it's, nobody believes that but the women. And I think we can look at that and we can see, wow, that's, that stands out in, in that world. But in a world today where we do have far more equality uh, than arguably we've ever had between the sexes, um, we can look at this and see a lot of that trickle down comes from these Judeo-Christian concepts. I mean, I mean, let that sink in for a moment. Christianity was mocked for being too pro-women in the ancient world. It, the, literally, the, the objections were, they're too full of women. And ancient writers like Lucian and Celsus, they dismissively castigate Christianity as such. So when you say agency... Can I ask you um, if you can perhaps define that a little bit for us that might not follow exactly what that means? Yeah, so agency in terms of um, e- equality of, of opportunity, uh, in terms of seeing both male and female in a, equal in their status as human beings. Um, so... Now, we definitely put people on different statuses in, in terms of their, you know, economic status, in terms of um, certain qualifications. And I think that's, that's normal. Uh, in some ways, that's healthy. But we definitely wouldn't say that 
you know, if someone has a has a greater number of academic degrees than I do, well, then they're more of a human being than I am. Uh, that doesn't make sense in, in our modern world because we understand uh, sort of that humanity is is equal to one another in in the, the term is ontologically like in their being they are equal we're all in the same boat we're all part of the human race but that's not true for the ancient world if you were a a roman soldier or sorry if, if you were to walk up to a roman soldier in the ancient world and point to say a slave on, on the road and um say hey did you know that he has just as much worth as you do the, the Roman soldier would look at you and go, no, of course he doesn't. He's way lower than I am in terms of my humanness. Um, and actually, it's interesting, when Christianity was eventually decriminalized by Emperor Constantine in uh, 312 AD, what's referred to as the Edict of Milan, and Christians were given the ability to hold political standing, along with that, laws were placed on the books for the first time that protected women and children from abuse. And one year after that, in, in AD 313, uh, infanticide was outlawed. And then shortly after that, in, in 321, a financial provision for um, single and poor women uh, and was, was given. Um, if for no other reason, then there was a practice in the ancient world where if women were, um, if they were divorced unfairly, or if they became widows, or if they fell into economic collapse, they would often sell their children for subsistence. And these, these uh, sort of social safety nets were put into place by the government, um, particularly through the Christian means to prevent this, to outlaw it. And, and in uh, 428, actually, there's a, uh, there was a law against pimps, uh, fathers and slave owners who were exploiting women for sex. Um, that was condemned and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And that's the first time in the ancient world that we really start to see those things. And that's what I mean by giving agency. Uh, the progression of equality, mind you, was slow in Rome, um, wasn't built in a day. And a, but a lot of its social institutions that were... Um, uh, pervasive, these things took time to chip away. Uh, there's no denying that. But eventually, what we see is we see the Christian worldview starting to permeate the ancient world. You don't you don't get these sorts of laws passed. You don't get this idea that men and women are are created equal uh, anywhere in the ancient world. And I would actually advocate also the modern world, aside from the Judeo Christian worldview. That's where it comes from. You, you wouldn't naturally uh, get, these, get these ideas. Like I said, those hierarchies of, um, you know, the, the, the kings and the emperors being on top and then, you know, the social stratus and then really uh, women, uh, little children, slaves, uh, barbarians, you know, those types of people, they're on the very bottom. That is how the ancient world saw it. And it's when we start to see Christianity permeating throughout the society that we start to see equality. And um, that's, that's where we start to see uh, that there's no denying that the growth and prevalence of Christianity and it's an understanding that all are made in the image of God, right? Like I said, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. And that as I mentioned also um, in Galatians uh, 3.28, Paul says that in Christ, there is no male nor female. These types of ideas, they completely revolutionized the ancient world's understanding of equality and particularly value when it came to women. Looking uh, back at the Old Testament, for example, so like the argument I'm hearing in my head concerning this is why couldn't God just have said these things in the beginning um like throughout the old testament because you see um examples laws that um they seem to um what am i trying to say like they everything that you just described about how women were viewed in the ancient world 
it seems that the the culture that the Bible is um, talking about has been influenced mm. by these ideas of women, and um, so it's not. So I think um, people like skeptics would argue that God is advocating for those views of women. Um, but to me, it makes more sense to, to notice that in the beginning, God was saying the same thing as um, in the New Testament, that men and women are equal. But, um, you know, you have, at some point, you have to uh, take into account man's responsibility in the way the world is functioning and the beliefs in the world. And um, so God said something about the perception of, of women, the truthfulness of the value of women. But um, it seems to me that um, like the, the way that the world believed was a lot different than what God had spoken already in the beginning. So to me, it seems unfair to blame what was going on uh, regarding women, to blame it on God. Whereas perhaps it would make more sense that like in the Old Testament, um, the laws were more of regulating how the world was operating, the perceptions of women, and that God was actually going to bring clarity again about all of that through Jesus. Is, would you agree? Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of, a uh, lot of truth truth in, in what you, you just articulated. Um, I think, like I said before, that uh, there's a very different social setting that a lot of these books are written within. And we sometimes, and it's easy, and, and we're all guilty of this in one way or another, um, forget that and read our own context onto particular passages and think, wow, this sounds, this sounds crazy. Uh, but when we put them in the framework of understanding what was going on within that day in those settings, I think it really starts to fill out our picture. I also think there's a lot of things, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are um, descriptive in the sense that they're describing what is happening. Uh, so I think there are really three categories that we can talk about when we talk about particular verses within scripture. Um, there's uh, descriptive, there's prescriptive, and then there's um, explanatory, uh, so or emotive, I should put it. So descriptive, obviously, is describing things that are happening. So in a lot of the historical books, that's what we're getting. So when you see Joshua going out into the land of Canaan, and God is using Israel as his means of judgment to a morally depraved and corrupt people, to eliminate them. That's descriptive. That had a particular setting. And we, in the modern day, we don't use that as, as a template to, you know, therefore go and do likewise kind of thing. Um, it's describing something that happened within history in a particular context and setting. But then there are things that are prescriptive that we're told to do in terms of the law, in terms of the commandments, in terms of uh, things that God has promised to us as believers, um, those within, um, now there's a, a, a different application now that we're in the new covenant to a lot of that, uh, but it is nonetheless prescriptive. It's given to us for our benefit, really to live out that image of God in us. We are created to be in the image of God. And so things like the 10 commandments are just reminders that those things are the opposite of the character of God. God is not a liar. God is not a thief. God is not a murderer. And so you and I, created in that image, um, were likewise not supposed to be thieves and liars and murderers and adulterers and coveters. By actually obeying those things, we start to live out how we are more human. Um, those things aren't there to, to be a buzzkill to the things that, that are perceived as fun, but they're actually there for our good. And those are prescriptive. And then there are uh, things that are emotive in the sense that you have a lot of things written down, um, particularly in passages like the Psalms, uh, 
so if you open up to the very middle of the Bible, there's a book, um, one of the longest books of the Bible, if not the longest, well, it is the longest, I think, uh, called the Psalms. And this is a hymn book of the ancient Jewish people. And a lot of that are people like David and Asaph and others expressing emotive um, outcries to God or, you know, of not understanding. And when we understand that, that there are these three categories and we don't confuse them, uh, I think it starts to help us see that there are certain things that we see in the Bible that were not for the benefit of, of individuals like women. Uh, things like polygamy with men having more than one wife. And we see right from the beginning that God outlines that marriage is, is between a man and a woman and that there's that, that too. And God in certain settings allows the polygamy to happen, not because it's sanctioned by God, not because it's blessed by God, uh, but to show that that is not the way. That's a sign of the brokenness that we see in the world. And every time you see that happen for every individual in the Old Testament, it causes pain, it causes suffering, it causes a drawing away from the goodness and um, human thriving uh, that God has created for those individuals. And God allows those things to happen to teach, to teach those people uh, that this is not the right way. Uh, and they need to learn that. They need to learn that, that those things uh, are, are done, but that God uses them for both his glory um, and for the, the teaching and equipping of, of his people. So we do see a lot of those things within, within the scripture. We do th see things that we can read with our modern lens and say, what's going on here? I don't like that. Uh, but when we see that uh, in, in the context of their own day, they're actually quite radically the opposite uh, of that. And that even when we start to see that culture bleed into uh, what's being described, um, often that's a, that's a perversion, that's a, a sign of the brokenness that God is communicating to his people. Does that make sense? Yeah. So even Christians, when we're reading these stories, um, and we do come across times when these men took on multiple wives or had children with their servants. Mm -hmm. And um, is that a reflection of the influence that the ancient world had of women, even on, you know, obviously on men, but even on women themselves? For example, when we see Sarah encouraging her husband to take on another wife and to have, you know, try to fulfill what God had spoken, the promise of a, a child. She was kind of trying to make it happen through her servant. Um, it just, for someone like me in this time, it seems unthinkable to ask your husband to do that. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it was something so normal for her and that there were these customs happening during those times like that 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 child would be considered um if i'm understanding it correctly i, I kind of get the idea that that sarah thought that if if she had a child through her servant that it would sort of be considered like through her that she had a child sort of through her or am i thinking that wrong yeah well it would have been understood as yeah carrying on on the lineage yeah, of, of particularly the father. So I think what you're saying is, is, yeah, is yes, there, there were these sorts of cultural ideas, um, some of which uh, are good, some of which are bad, some of which are just what they were. I mean, they're, they're not good or bad. They just were what they were. Uh, but I think also greater than sort of the cultural norms of the day, a lot of these things are just signs of our own brokenness, our own selfishness, the wanderings of the human heart to fulfill desires and not seeing the greater plan that God has promised to us. So in the context of, of that particular story, God had promised to Abraham that, that a particular thing would happen. And 
when it wasn't happening in Abraham and Sarah's own timing, they, they took matters into their own hands. And I think what this exemplifies is that we, our hearts wander and we desire to try to fix something that in reality, God has promised good for us. And because we don't think that things are happening when they should, we start to, we start to try to remedy the situation on our own. And, and that's, what, that's what we see there. That's what we see in that particular situation. And um, a lot of the situations, I'm thinking of, of individuals like Solomon or Daniel, when we see instances of, of them taking other wives of polygamous uh, marriages or, or concubines or, or wh whatever you have there, it's always a sign of the brokenness of that individual being lived out um, of, of lust, of desire, of covetousness. And God permits those things. He allows them, but they're obviously not within uh, what he has, he has prescribed for individuals like David. And I think deep down, individuals like David knew that. They knew that you know, taking all of these wives, taking all of these concubines, and, and um, especially within the situation of David and Bathsheba, um, that was wrong. I think there's no getting around how wrong that was. Uh, but what it exemplifies is that even these great men of God, they are broken. They are still marred by sin. And until we fix our eyes in the, in the after cross perspective, fix our eyes on Jesus as the author and perfecter of our faith, we're always going to be prone to wander. And we see a lot of that in the Old Testament, particular, particularly within these, these situations of, of marriage and um, sexual exploits. It's always a brokenness. And uh, the, the ripple effect of that goes out and really affects uh, these people in, in a profound way, where you can see that if they had trusted God, if they had um, lived out the commands that he had given them, um, we're talking about particular in marriage, but in a whole range of contexts, it, it would have been better for them on, in the long run. It's kind of like God is showing us through the mistakes, through the choices of humanity over time. He's showing us how, how you know, immoral people are and how, how in desperate need people are of him in order to, to even think you know, uh, morally, like even, even just like how we talked about how Jesus impacted how the women were viewed and their agency, um, that improved, it became like, right, it became moral um, as a result of um, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it seems like people were not going to come to that, um, way of thinking on their own i mean we can see this throughout the time right it was thousands thousands of years of men not viewing women as mm -hmm. equals and you know and the opportunities that they have and how yeah they are they are treated by, as property in in the eyes of um, men and even even in the eyes of women the way that they perceive themselves they, they kind of accepted it if, you know, these women that were involved in um, pagan idolatry and they, I, I mean, I'm guessing if they, they had the choice to participate or perhaps maybe they didn't in some cases. You're right, Susan, in, in what you're articulating. And I think we also, uh, there's a, we need to be honest in the, the candid admission that the, the church throughout its near 2000 year history it still struggles to get this completely right, doesn't it? Um, there's, there has certainly and disastrously, disastrously and at times embarrassingly uh, been times where Christians have fallen short of the precedence that Jesus set before us in regard to the, the treatment of women as a, a group of broken, hurting, fallen individuals. The church has failed to live up to what, his, what it has been called to. Uh, and yet through the fog of brokenness and hypocrisy, I think there is the reality that our trust and hope 
is not in the church, uh, but is in Jesus. And the Christian mu- movement from the beginning, and a lot of things that I've already discussed and highlighted, um, has fought hard and long for the status and agency and equality of women. Uh, but that reality, however, presents a, a bit of a problem for some of our modern narratives uh, that want to claim that Christianity was and is oppressive to women, um, which is, I think, the opposite is is actually true. And unless uh, you want to s- state that uh, all of uh, the women who were so prominent within early Christ- the early Christian movement uh, were simply dim and gullible, um, an approach which is ironically patronizing and demeaning to women, then facts the, the facts point to uh, the, the evidence that Christianity, I think, has actually been the greatest movement to create agency uh, for marginalized groups, uh, not just women, uh, but slaves and uh, individuals of ethnicities that were seen as lower. Um, and even uh, the first wave feminism uh, in the 1920s was largely undergirded by Christian activism. The right to vote, inherit land, overturn um, denigration and exploitation of women to be seen as equals, this was all driven with the cry of equality of godly men and women who believed that the only foundation for these ideas was found in the idea that we are created in the image of God. I was listening to um, your other video on Mary Magdalene, and you brought up some, um, I don't know what you would call them, some books that were influenced by the Gnostics, one in particular, where um, it just said something really crazy about their views on women at the time, and that was after, right, after um, uh, Jesus' time on earth. So, Mm -hmm. and it just goes to show that um, there were still these beliefs, um, these perceptions of women that, that they were not equals. It was almost like they were fighting the, uh, responding to what Christianity was teaching now about women. And um, so could you talk about what, how were these attitudes seen and met by others like the Romans and the Gnostics who encountered Christianity? Yeah, I mean, I touched on it a little bit in the sense of you got this mockery of, of Christianity from some of the, the writings of, of the Roman and the Greek officials. Um, Lucian and Celsus are the two ones that I highlighted in particular. Uh, but yeah, like you said, there was this group of um, religious mystics that we, we categorize as the Gnostics and um, <clears throat> sometimes, excuse me, I think we can overplay our hands and portray the Gnostics as if they were one organized group. It was really a, a variety of different religious perspectives. There isn't necessarily one Gnosticism as much as the, the Gnostic philosophies were adopted in, in different ways and, and different um, uh, versions. But we have these writings that are referred to as the Gnostic Gospels. So writings like the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas. And they're not always very, very favorable towards uh, women. So I think the the one you're um, thinking of in particular that you mentioned uh, was uh, the last verse of the Gospel of Thomas has Peter talking with Thomas and, and saying, you know, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. And Jesus's response is, uh, that he's going to let Mary stay because he's going to make Mary male in order to be like uh, the rest of the other uh, male spirits. And then the last line of the Gospel of Thomas, Logion 114, is every woman who, ma- who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. And so you still have these ideas that, you know, it's not good to be female. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a lower status uh, economically, socially, and in this sense, spiritually, that being female is is actually a a, uh, a handicap in sort of the spiritual progression of how the universe works uh, in in Gnosticism. That 
the creator of this world was an evil demiurge and was female. And going along with what I talked about before is the, the, the dualism of like the physical being bad and the spiritual being good, the Gnostics fitting right into that cultural uh, understanding and norm believe that, well, the, if the creator of this world was female and the, the physical of this world is, is evil, then that creator deity has also, has also a need to be evil because only evil could bring in the, the physicalness of this world, which is in turn evil. And so all of this affected the way that women were seen within um, uh, not just, as I said before, the Greco-Roman system, but in some of these other religious systems where women were seen as, as lower, as less than, and um, in, in the case of the Gospel of Thomas, as uh, not, as Peter says, not worthy of life. Uh, and you can read that either um, literally not worthy of life uh, because they're, they're lower in status or uh, of, of spiritual life, that they're, they wouldn't enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus's response is to say that, well, all the women who, who are on my team, I'm going to make them male so they will, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And that seems bizarre to us. And it is bizarre. Um, uh, but that would have, in one sense, fit into uh, the box of this anti-feminine bias that, that existed in uh, their, that time. And the early Christians saw this and, and condemned it outright. Said, no, that's, that's nonsense. Um, both in... Uh, both in in um, two places in the Gospels and or sorry not in the Gospels in the New Testament in Galatians and Ephesians, uh, Paul talks about um, or Colossians and Ephesians sorry uh, about this idea of men and women being equal in them in Christ there is no male or female um, and then even in in uh, in some of the writings of uh, First Peter. And in Ephesians, uh, when it sort of the marriage is talked about, uh, it's talked about in a, a way that reflects that men and women, particularly in the marriage relationship, um, there's a there's a reciprocity there. There's a, a an equalness that um, yes, m women are to um, be submissive, and men. Well, men are supposed to love their wives like Christ loved the church and gave his life up for her. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the highest calling uh, any man could be held to, in, in this, in, particularly in a world where the, the man would have been seen as first priority, and not just in uh, the marriage, but in society in general, to say, well, actually, you guys have to sacrifice yourself for your wife, uh, well, that that was that was very uh, countercultural uh, in in that day. Um, for Paul to say, yeah, Ephesians five twenty five, just as Christ who loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a big statement, and I think should not be taken lightly, even today, um, in understanding you know how the the marriage bond works. When we read things like the teachings of submission for women mm. about um, women not um, being able to have this authoritative role in the church because of what you just explained. Um, some people may uh, think, well, that sounds like a man came up with that in order to oppress women. How do we know that Paul wasn't just speaking as a man? And how do we know that that's actually like inspired by the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I think we need to be careful not to read those passages through maybe a lens of uh, postmodernism or a third wave feminism and understand that Actually, if you read those type, what those verses are talking about in context, uh, even the submission in marriage is mentioned um, in a 
in a way that's reciprocal, in the sense that both the husband and the wife are to submit first to God and then to one another. And um, submitting, although that word can, can often, in our culture, rub, rub us the wrong way, we, we feel like that's a, a negative. I mean, Christ submitted to the Father. Uh, Christ submitted unto death. So uh, God himself, there's a sub- self-submitting in that. And it's not a negative. Uh, it's, it's a sacrificial servanthood to one another. And we, we can often get the wrong impression uh, by a, a word like submit. Um, but I think uh, what, what we're seeing here is that, especially in when that word is used in the First Peter uh, passage, First Peter 3, uh, 1 to 7, what we see is um, a submission uh, that's related both to uh, the man and the woman. So I think there are, there are a few things that submission is not that, that are important to understand. Um, submission is not giving up your rights. Um, submission is, is an expression of freedom in the sense that we exhibit and manifest freedom in purpose and the, the ordering of things. Uh, even you think of uh, Paul says in, in Philippians 2 8 that Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a, on a cross. And that's, that's the submission that Christ gave. That's not a, uh, a giving up of his rights. Uh, it's, it's actually a practice of the rights that he has as the, the second person of the Trinity, as the Son of God. So the first thing that I think it is important to remember is submission is not a giving up of one's rights. The second thing uh, that I would, I would highlight is that submission is not agreeing, particularly in this marriage context, agreeing with your husband no matter what. That's not what it's talking about. And we know this because um, the husband in the context of the First Peter 3 passage is an unbeliever. What Peter's talking about there is he's talking about a relationship where a wife has come to Christ and the husband is not. And I think actually the background to that is that that passage that I quoted to you from Pliny, where he says, you know, women are not supposed to have their own friends uh, and their own gods. Their friends are their husband's friends and their gods are the husband's gods. Now that would have put the woman in a very precarious situation if she became a Christian. Because not only is her God now different than her husband's gods, but she now knows and understands that her husband's gods don't exist. And that could actually uh, be very dangerous for her. And, and what Peter's talking about in that passage is he's not saying, you just have to agree with your husband no matter what. That's not what submission is. Because he, he understands, and it's, it's uh, indicated within the text, um, that if the husband asks the woman to do something that's obviously wrong uh, to lie or steal or murder or give up her faith, that she's not going to do that because she is a follower of Christ. And so in that sense, um, I think we can see that uh, submission is not agreeing with everything that her husband uh, is is telling her to do or, or meaning her to say that and then third, so the, the first thing I, I highlighted was um, submission is not giving up of your rights. Submission is not agreeing with everything your, your husband says, no matter what. And then the third thing I think that's important to keep in mind is that submission is, is a gentleness, but it's not a weakness. Um, and actually, in, the, in that passage where we get this, uh, submission language used in First Peter, he then immediately uh, he immediately points to Sarah, who who you mentioned um, before, as the example of this. And I think that's interesting because Sarah is not she's not a a wallflower. Do you know that expression? She's not like timid. Um, if you read the story. Uh, she's not a weak woman of the Bible. Um, she was the one chosen to bear the seed of the promises. Uh, 
she tells Abraham what he should do in respect to Ishmael. And Abraham doesn't necessarily like what Sarah tells him. <laughs> and yet she tells him anyways. And then God's promise in Genesis 21, 12 is, um, he says, whatever Sarah tells you to do, do it. So it's interesting that, that Peter talks about this submission and then points to Sarah as an example of that, because Sarah is actually a very strong example of a woman who is very involved in her, her marriage. Um, and if submission is supposed to mean being weak, uh, being passive, uh, to let the other spouse lord over you, then Peter's doing a really bad job by giving the example of Sarah. Um, so I think that's what submission is not. Uh, but that still doesn't answer the question of what submission is. Now, in some ways, I've, I've, I think I've hinted at this with talking about like the examples of Christ's submission. Um, but in Philippians 3, um, it says, uh, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already uh, reached perfection. Um, and so I think we need to, we need to realize that um, sometimes we comment on these things and we ourselves haven't been perfect examples of them. Um, but what we see in the examples of submission is that submission is, is this servant heartedness uh, that Christ first and foremost was the example to us to be. Um, and that when the Bible talks about submission, particularly um, in the context of women, uh, that we can often read that as a negative. But I would actually say that that is, in, in the context of what's being written, it's a positive. It's telling us something about not only what we're supposed to do and who we are, but ultimately who Christ is and what he's done for us as the example of that submission, first and foremost. Yeah, that is actually really helpful. Um... I never really considered Sarah um, in that light and with regards to submission. So I feel like you brought a lot of uh, good information to what submission is actually saying, you know, in the Bible. And um, I think a lot of women will find that helpful in their own marriages. The last thing that I would like us to look at, what has been the impact that Jesus and the Christian worldview has had on the status of women. And like with regards to the things that we've already talked about, for example, um, polygamy, um, where that was common in the New Testament, we have examples that the leaders in the church are actually um, required to only be married to one woman, for example. Or um, any other examples that you can think of, of how how this, uh, this Christian worldview has changed things that used to be one way for women and the way women were perceived, and now um, it's changed. Yeah, well, I think it, the Christian worldview, as it starts to permeate society, it definitely impacts the whole of society. And uh, its impact on women is, is probably the, the strongest, um, but also it's, it's impact on how slaves were seen. Um, <clears throat> there's a great book that came out last year, uh, by a historian named Tom Holland. So, uh, there's an, the actor who played Spider-Man is also called Tom Holland. So not that Tom Holland. Uh, this is a different Tom Holland. He, he wrote a book called Dominion and it's a, it's a big brick of a book, um, I looked back on my shelf while you were talking to see if I, I had it, but I actually just lent it to my pastor. So I, I can't show you what it looks like, but uh, in it, he's not a Christian, but what he does, which is fascinating is he, he evaluates how the Christian worldview has impacted, particularly the trickle down of modern society, uh, but throughout society. So he's an expert on um, ancient antiquity, which is like the Greco Roman world heading up into the middle ages. Ages. And he, even as a non-Christian, he specifically states 
that only the Christian worldview gives you the foundation for saying that everybody on the planet has equal rights. You do not get that from any other worldview. And the way he describes it, I'm paraphrasing, but but it's, it's really good. This is actually, what I'm doing is I'm paraphrasing Tom Holland through the paraphrase of another guy, um, Glenn Scrivener, who uh, has an organization called Speak Life out in the UK. He's Australian. And how he summarizes it is he says that every worldview perspective, whether it's ancient or modern, whether we're talking about you know ancient Mesopotamians or the Greco-Roman world or Islam or modern day secular natural materialism is based on some form of survival of the fittest. The fit survive and outperform the weak. But what's different about Christianity is that it's not based on survival of the fittest. It's based on the fittest sacrificing himself for the survival of the weakest. And so it flips the script on its head, which is exactly what some of the things, the undertones that we miss because we're not in the ancient world and reading these things and seeing Paul saying, you know, in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek, nor male, nor female, nor slave, nor master, nor um, Scythian, nor barbarian. And so he's covering things like gender and um, uh, ethnicity and social status and And we kind of say, well, yeah, of course. But in the ancient world, they would have gone, whoa, 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 hold on. There's no male nor female? There's obviously a difference between male and female. What are you talking about? Slave and master? There's obviously a difference. If If I come to the table and the elder in my church is one of my slaves, well, Paul is saying, you know, you need to submit to that individual. Like, it's totally turning the narrative on its head. And I think we assume these things within the modern world, particularly our views about women, that women are equal, that, that both men and women are equal, that we have inalienable rights, that we have worth, that we have value by just being human. Those are Christian values. Those are Judeo-Christian values. And if you really dig into them, you have to get them from the Christian worldview. You have to get them from the Bible. There is no other place where you can ground that. It comes from, first and foremost, the idea of being created in the image of God. Both male and female, he created them. And then, on top of that, Christ sacrificing himself, laying himself down as a slave, a, a, the, the Greek word means slave or servant, for us. Now, Jesus said the son of man did not come to serve, but to, or sorry, not to be served, but to serve. And I think that, especially in the context of what we're talking about with women, that I think is something that we assume in our society without really giving it too much of a second thought and not realizing that that finds its foundation within the Bible. All of the things that we like about society in terms of equal rights and um, justice and uh, uh, you know fighting oppression, all of those are Christian ideas when you really dig into them. And it's, it's coming from a, a worldview that's founded on the words and teachings and life example of Jesus. I'll just finish with this. Tom Holland has this great, um, he, he talks about how we're so steeped in this, we don't even realize that's what it is anymore. The Christian worldview is so much around us, particularly in the Western world. I'm in Canada, you're in the United States, but this goes equally for a lot, a lot of places in Europe and Asia and Africa. We are so steeped in these this type of language that we forget that it's Christianity. We're the fish swimming in the water, and you know, it's like the cartoon of the two fish and and one fish. Uh, there are th- two fish swimming, and one fish passes it and says, "Hey, the water's fine today," and they keep swimming on. And then the one fish turns to the other fish and goes, "What's water?" 
It's because they're, they're, they're in the water. They have no idea what water is because they're just so, that's the air they breathe. And the air we breathe is Christianity when we're talking about this stuff, whether we know it or not. These ideas that women and men are equal, that women should be given the exact uh, equal opportunities as men, that, that women uh, and men are, are on the same standing ontologically in terms of their, their self-worth and who they are and how we value them. Those are Christian ideas. Oh, so good. Um, thank you so much for being here today and sharing all of this amazing information. And if anyone is interested in checking out Wesley's YouTube channel, I'll um, include the link in the description of this video. And also your website also has a lot of great information that I'm excited to go and learn up and you know study up on all of that. Again, thank you so much for being here and, and sharing this, you know, to us for free. Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me, Susan. I really appreciate that.